Good morning. Thank you for being so many uh, early in the morning for this uh, session of uh, reports of the working groups. I, I have the privilege to report uh, for the workshop on finance and economy, which took place under the chairmanship of uh, Jean-Claude Trichet. Our discussion covered the overall economic situation, the outlook for international trade, the potential risks involved with cryptocurrencies, and for quite a lively discussion, major issues in development finance. So let me start with the economic situation. While last year we had, mess, we had met almost in the middle of the storm at a time of surging inflation, and we had been discussing the reactions of central banks, the timing of very likely interest rate rises, the probability of recession, Participants noted this year that inflation, while still a bit too high, had started again abating in major economies, and that the question this year was whether when central bank would start to cut interest rates, and probably not before mid-2024. But clearly, the tightening cycle was coming to an end. The discussion on current economic prospects underlined the difference between the United States and Europe. In the United States, relative optimism was prevailing in an economy at full employment, experiencing a rise in business investment in response notably to the Expansionary Inflation Reduction Act. The policy mix in the US was thus characterized by a cautious monetary policy expected to ease only when unemployment would start increasing, and by a fiscal policy not expected to undergo any major change in 2024, but whose expansionary effects would continue to be felt. As a result, in a textbook-like Mundell Fleming model, for those who have been ex exposed to economic modeling, economic growth was expected to continue, interest rate would remain relatively high and start declining later in 2024, and the dollar would remain strong. The soft landing scenario, at least in the United States, seemed to be becoming a reality. In contrast with the apparent prosperity in the US, growth was much more subdued in Europe, notably due to a higher sensitivity to the shock represented by the war in Ukraine. This divergence with the US was expected to remain at least till the end of 2024. The Chinese economy was facing the implications of the industrial property bubble and a growth slowdown with a paralysis of entrepreneurship. It was mentioned that manufacturing was sensitive to cycles, like in countries such as Korea, Japan, and other economies, including and, and even Germany, and that in turn, the Chinese economy itself was entering a regime of economic cycles with recurring ups and downs. Overall, prospects for 2024 were expected to be more rosy, with two potential downside risks, of course, a further slowdown in China and a worsening of the international crisis, notably crisis in the Middle East. The latter presented a risk of increased energy prices, of a rise of investments in defense, of declining world trade, of a decline in global confidence and a rise of global uncertainties, of an increase in market volatility, and a risk of return of inflationary pressures. So far, however, it was noted that stock markets had not seemed to be affected too strongly, <laughs> Altogether, the geopolitical risk could fully derail this relatively quiet scenario, and the group seemed reasonably confident, but recognized that this confidence was fragile and that unfortunate surprises might sanction any undue complacency. As part of our discussion on the economic situation, the rise in public indebtedness was also mentioned as a source of concern, especially in a situation where one might have doubts about the evolution in the foreseeable future of the difference between the growth rate and the interest rate, which is a major indicator of the sustainability uh, of the debt burden. This was seen as a further argument to credibly bring inflation down as a way to restore the capacity to bring interest rates down. Let me move to the outlook for international trade. While trade had grown faster than global production from 1950 to 2008, it was no longer the case since about 2012. Trade is now growing more slowly than global GDP, and this is expected to continue 
in the context of a weakening World Trade Organization, WTO, many new protectionist measures have been adopted and the commitment to achieve the Doha round remained a dead letter. The dispute settlement of the WTO is itself in this dispute. While a characteristic of the post-World War II order has been a liberalization of trade driven by gains in cost and economic efficiency, and supported by a growing evidence that import substitution strategies did not produce lasting growth, there was now a shift to new considerations in which the security concern and broadly speaking security across energy supplies, food and health, the control of technology was indeed pregnant. This shift could be attributed to the so-called three C's, conflict, COVID and climate concerns. And all this is leading to potential trade barriers. In addition, the emerging focus on technology and industrial policy is resulting in new forms of subsidies and trade restrictions. There are also trade diversions. Earlier Chinese manufacturer exports uh, are now sometimes diverted by industrial delocalization of Chinese firms to nearby expanding countries. In this context, the call by the G20 to reaffirm support to a rules-based system, including fair, open, non-discriminatory, inclusive, sustainable and transparent trade, centered around the strengthening of the WTO, a commitment to fully restore its functioning dispute settlement mechanism, and all this appeared as a set of promises not really backed, at least yet, by an active agenda. Let me now move to what we discussed about financial innovations and financial risks. There was a brief discussion of the financial innovations introduced by cryptocurrencies and a debate about central bank electronic money. First of all, the total amount of cryptocurrencies in circulation was estimated to around 1,000 billion euros, half in bitcoins, half in other cryptocurrencies. And this is actually only half sort of half the balance sheet of a big bank like BNP Paribas. The point is that the development of these cryptocurrencies, while highly speculative, is not creating any systemic risk. However, it was emphasized that they were introducing a real risk of fraud, criminal activities, and the, financing, the risk of financing of terrorism. In contrast, other financial innovations could be considered as a major change and a major revolution for retail banks, that of electronic payments made through smartphones, and they have become a major part of retail payments. Central bank electronic money was also under active discussion and was expected to represent a real threat for retail banking and to introduce major questions about the future of banks. However, central banks are conscious of the risk involved and seem to be keen of introducing central bank electronic CBEM versions that wouldn't threaten the stability of the banking system. Finally, we discussed, again very actively and in depth, development finance issues. Many developing countries, especially in Africa, are under a severe credit crunch. Many are in debt distress after years of piling up debt as abundant liquidity was recycled in quest of higher returns in the context of very low world interest rates. The situation today is radically different. In a very tense geopolitical context, people in developed countries are less and less interested in the rest of the world. Billions are committed by seldom made available private flows are diminishing for rational reasons, governments in developed countries face high public debt and tight fiscal constraints, while they again resort to active industrial policies, and risk aversion has again increased. African countries under debt distress do pay their debt service because they realize that the costs of default are extremely high, but it leaves them without resources to pay for health, education, basic services, not mentioning the need to finance sustainable green growth strategies and the energy transition. In fact, many countries receive now less new funds than they pay debt service. They experience net negative transfers from developed countries. Some African countries are even under net negative transfers 
from China, so they pay more to China than they receive from China. Developing country debt today is characterized by the weight of private creditors, notably in the forms of bonds, on the one hand, and the importance of non pie club members, including China, on the other hand. China has emerged as the first bilateral creditor for public and publicly guaranteed debt of developing countries. It can be understood as other traditional creditors were no longer available to fund African and other developing country needs. It was pointed out that there is no pro-China ideology in African countries, but simply given that their situations, they are welcoming new money whenever available. Anyhow, right now, new money is very scarce and China is no longer providing new funding, nor likely to resume such funding in the near future. This combination makes debt negotiations particularly difficult since China is not bound by the disciplines and experience set up by the Paris Club and private actors are not keen to consider debt reduction or rescheduling actions. G20 initiatives so far, such as the Common Framework, have met little success in terms of implementation. More recently, the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable has been set up as a low-profile initiative involving lenders and borrowers, both public and private, and the sentiment in the group was that this could be more effective uh, than past attempts. It was agreed that we do need to bring China to the board as well as private funders. There is a dramatic contrast between this credit crutch situation and a broad international agreement that financing should be scaled up and forthcoming, both because development needs and about the imperative of dealing with climate change. And such a scaling up should be supported by the mobilization of private finance. None of this or very little of this is happening. Instead, ODA flows are increasingly absorbed by a number of needs that go well beyond genuine development finance. For example, the funding of refugees in donor countries themselves, or the funding for climate change mitigation. It was pointed out that despite an increase in ODA statistics, actual ODA going to Africa had in fact decreased. A major issue related to the effectiveness and timeliness of ODA, ODA was also uh, the nature and implementation of conditionality. Developed countries' intentions are plagued by some confusion and an inability to use existing instruments, such as guarantees, including the World Bank's MIGA, or to actually and effectively leverage private funds. There is some confusion between, on the one hand, climate adaptation needs, which should actually be mainstreamed as what should be looked as a basic good development strategy, and on the other hand, climate change mitigation objectives, which only really concern a dozen or so emerging countries likely to have an impact. A lot of African countries are too small to have any mitigating impact, so the focus there should be on adaptation and development. However, multi-development banks, the MDBs, are not equipped to selectively allocate mitigation-related funding to these countries in priority. It is now important to think about ways to differentiate support for mitigation on the one hand and for adaptation and broader development. As for the, mobiliz the mobilization of private funding, it has been largely unsuccessful and this is mainly due to a prevailing culture of risk aversion in development finance institutions. Such risk aversion not only affects decision and the capacity to innovate, but it also penalizes the implementation of decisions, existing instruments, and potentially promising initiatives to the requirements of increasingly complex due processes intended to control risk in development finance institutions. While this is understandable, it appears as a major impediment in the effectiveness and availability of development finance. As a result, there is much talk on and agreement on the need to react urgently to the current emergencies, but subsequent action doesn't look like any emergency. For all the focus in our discussion on these tough issues, the general impression in the group was that the global economy had so far muddled through and shown impressive resilience, and that we should focus our attention on 
on actually implementing initiatives and commitments, and that for this to happen, inclusive dialogues and debates were necessary. Thank you very much, and I'm now giving the floor to Group 2.